Um, hello, wonderful world. So today <laughs> I'm with Patrick, a young gentleman I met through YouTube. Um, the story is um, I make a YouTube channel, sorry, I make YouTube videos. Uh, not very interesting, but I have a few followers. And a long time ago, Patrick saw a couple of the videos. And then when I was in Thailand, probably because I was close to him ge geographically, one of my videos popped up and he sent me a message. Are you around town? Can we meet? And we met. And then we started discussing YouTube and other things. We're both bikers. Um, and young Patrick is pursuing a YouTube channel. And I'm pretty sure with what he's told me, it's going to be a successful YouTube channel. So I'm here to interview Patrick. Now, Patrick, I'm going to ask you lots of questions. And some of them may be X-rated. <laughs> no, I'm joking. I'm jesting. Um, so tell me a little bit about yourself. I know that you're a journalist. You're a photographer. Um, where did you start and how did your life bring you to North Thailand? Oh, that's a long story, a shaggy dog story. Uh, I'm not sure I'm a journalist. I used to be, many, many decades ago, I used to be a press photographer, which is why I've still got, I have again the press card, and, uh, but I don't do that for a living now. Perhaps if I, if I am successful with this YouTube channel, it will become a sort of living. I have to be careful with things like that in Thailand because I'm officially here as a retiree Although I'm so young, as you kindly mentioned, I am actually retired here in Thailand, but um, I'm not supposed to work. The Thais are very tough and strict on that, you know, so that if you're officially here on a retirement visa, you're not allowed to do any sort of work. I think and I hope they close one eye at least to people who are running YouTube channels. And there are quite a few older people doing that in Thailand. Anyway, uh, I may become a sort of, if I get some income, if I actually manage to get monetized, on YouTube with my new with my new uh, channel, then I think um, it may become who knows a source of income as well. But as I say, I was many years ago, many decades ago, I was a photographer, and I've done quite a few different things. I, I was a trained, I am a trained teacher. I went back to doing a little bit of teaching during COVID. I did online English teaching, uh, so I had lots of students, mainly from Asia, from Japan, from Taiwan, from Korea from China, um, when I was uh, teaching again recently online. So I was a trained teacher, I was a photographer. Um, then I went into uh, recruitment. I ended up quite suddenly, and for me also as a surprise, I should say, in Germany, where I spent most of my life. I'm originally from the UK and now have an Irish passport uh, because my father was from Ireland. Um, but I lived in Germany and I got a job working for a big American headhunting company, Executive Search. So that's what I got into when I was 20 something as a headhunter. Then I ended up working for uh, TV stations. I worked for a company called Thames Television, which older people from the UK will know. <laughs> yes. They used to be a very big UK broadcaster. And I ran, set up and ran a, uh, uh, an office for them in Germany, in Frankfurt. I was their first overseas media salesperson. So I worked for them for a couple of years. Then I ended up, after that working, I worked for a, a German, uh, adver well, a French advertising agency in Germany in the media department. And then I moved, to, um, I moved to the biggest German TV station, which is actually known, if it's known at all by English speakers in Europe, it's known for Radio Luxembourg. It's RTL, which is the biggest right. commercial TV station in Germany. Um, I worked for them selling media also. And then more than 20 years ago, I went back into headhunting, but specialized in the media sector. So all of my clients, going back a couple of years ago now, before COVID, all my clients are in the media sector. So I did a lot of work for people like MTV, Discovery, Reuters, um, big German uh, publishers and so on. So I've done, done a lot of work in the media field, but more recently, as I say, more than 20 years actually, uh, as a recruiter. So my job, I've done a lot of interviews, but not the sort of conversation we're having today. More interviews about people's you know, experience at work, where their strengths and weaknesses lie, that sort of thing. 
I think your skill set in media, and certainly one thing that I have noticed as I uh, get to know you better, and, and even our uh, first meeting, is that you're quite um, the clarity in which you ask questions, the way you put yourself forward. It makes you um, very neutral and, and very likable. So uh, maybe nice this, to this, <laughs> maybe this YouTube channel is the next progression in your media career. Well, who knows? Yeah. Maybe yeah. I'll become one of those. Like the Kardashians become an influencer <laughs> with billions and billions and don't know what to do well, with it. Well, you know? I mean... I don't um, think that's going to happen so Yeah, I was going to say, I, I wish you the best of luck, but let, let's not uh, let's not dream so big. Um, no, I'm not, I'm not think, dreaming of that. I don't, yeah. I don't have any ambition to becoming a long-lost member of the Kardashians. <laughs> it's not so, an ambition of mine. So one thing that comes from talking to you is that you have travelled a great yes. deal. Yeah, I've, I've lived, as I said, I've actually... I left the UK where I was living before, uh, for some time at least, um, I left in 1981. So I've been out of the UK, living in the UK for more than 40 years. Yes. And I spent more than 30 years in Germany. I have a daughter who's become German, partly because of Brexit. She had a British passport, which wasn't much use to her uh, after Brexit happened. So she got herself a German passport, which is no big problem for her because she was born in Germany and spent all her life in Germany, went to school in Germany and German is her first language, so she got herself a German passport. Um, I went a slightly different route and got myself the Irish passport a year before Brexit. So I had a feeling that was going to happen. Yeah. So, and I'd been living at the time, I was living in Prague. I moved from Germany, went to live in the Czech Republic, where I lived for seven years before I moved to Thailand, which is a wonderful uh, city, Prague. And... Um, uh, whilst I was there, I, I was one of the first, probably, to go to the local Irish embassy and get myself an Irish passport. And I did that a year by virtue of my ancestry through my father on, on, his, on that side of the family. Um, I, uh, I got there a year before everybody else. A lot of other people who had the right to Irish citizenship, Brits mm -hmm. who wanted to keep traveling and maybe living abroad after Brexit, did the same thing, but they did that after Brex after the Brexit referendum, and I did it a year before. They joined the crowd, whereas you were single in that line. I, I I would be curious to know how the population of Ireland has actually expanded. I imagine by quite a few hundred thousand so. actually since so. uh, you know since the Brexit referendum. Simply because there were lots of people that were pro Brexit, but uh, their passion for Brexit was equally matched, I think, even more so for those that were against Brexit. So I, I imagine there were lots of people who looked at their ancestry and tried to get a European passport, so they had that option. Well, uh, apparently, uh, a large number of uh, Northern Irish uh, Unionists, Protestants, who are very attached to the UK and theoretically at least very anti the idea of the Republic of Ireland, have got themselves... Irish citizenship, which they're entitled to automatically because they're Irish, they're Northern Irish, in as part of the UK in Northern Ireland. And apparently an awful lot of those politicians who otherwise would be thumping the tub yeah. um, uh, for unionism have got themselves uh, dual, as a dual, uh, nation, you know, dual nationality, as dual citizens, got themselves Irish citizenship as well, which they don't talk about very much. Yeah. Uh, because it's frankly it's very well, convenient. I, I, you know? I think in this this Brexit uh, fiasco, for want of a better description, I think the people of Northern Ireland suffered the most. And, and in fact, even though uh, if you think about it, in that equation they were a big. Um, they should have been a constant, but they were a big variable. They were actually discounted altogether, and that's quite yes. a, a, a shame, really. Uh, it's sad. Yes. Um, but you, I, anyway, I know we're, we're before we spoke about Prague, you spoke about Prague with such um, reverence and and glee, for want of a better word. Um, but you're not in Prague. You're in Thailand. So exactly. Tell me, yes. Tell me how you came to Thailand. And well, yeah, that's a good that's a good good point. I mean, I I I, I like Prague very much, and you know, now we have the so-called winter of Thailand here. We're the uh, middle of December making this uh, it's beautiful. Little, little chat is wonderful. It's what the Thais up here at least call winter, which is, I think, quite funny because, and some of them put on thick fleeces in this weather because the, the temperatures drop below 30 degrees centigrade. So for them, it's like winter. Uh, but, there, you know, there are times when I think at least as a visitor, if not as a, as, as a resident, it would be nice to be back in Prague 
with a few inches of snow on the ground and in a cozy Prague um, pub with some Czech beer in my hand. Uh, it's one of the things I, I, I might occasionally miss, but um, it's a good question how I came. Uh, you know, during COVID, um, which is when I discovered your YouTube channel, I think a lot of people during COVID, they did what I was doing. They did uh, online teaching and an awful lot of people. And that's when Zoom probably shot out of nowhere. I mean, that must have been the business plans for Zoom. Yes. They must have been torn up very quickly because they must have, you know, there must have been so many years they in were advance of their business plans. And yeah. Because online, the whole online world in that sense and the online working, that's a big thing for me as an old recruiter, which is a new phenomenon. Um, and actually made the lives of recruiters much easier in many ways too. Until COVID, as a recruiter, I'm changing the subject a little bit, but uh, as a recruiter, it was always necessary to go and meet your candidates uh, face to face for good reason, because you get a different feel when you meet people face to face than you do on a video camera. But still, uh, necessarily during COVID, that wasn't literally wasn't allowed in a lot of places. You know, you weren't allowed to go and meet people face to face if it wasn't essential. So one of the things that changed, of course, at least in, you know, in the Western world, is that millions of people still are working from home, if not five days a week, then two or three days a week. I'm going off the subject a bit, but that's what happened in COVID is I started online teaching. Millions of people started uh, uh, doing lessons, learning other languages, for example, online. And what also happened, and that's coming back to answer your question, what also happened is that a lot of people like me in their nice apartment in the middle of the old city of Prague uh, started uh, daydreaming and traveling and getting inspiration to travel by watching videos, especially videos of people doing those long, you know, um, long way round type uh, motorbike trips, you know, the itchy boots of this world, uh, riding across continents. I started watching her channel during COVID when she, in fact, about the same time, I think she was just before COVID, she started in India. She bought a Royal Enfield Himalayan in Himalayan, you have to call it, in India. And she rode from India to here, to Thailand and down to Malaysia. And that's what I started thinking, that's a nice thing to do. Nice to have a motorbike license, nice to have a motorbike, nice to travel across Asia, across India, Myanmar, because you'd already traveled a lot of these countries. I've been here as a tourist. Yeah. There's obviously, as, all, as everybody knows, I think, there's a big difference between being a tourist in a country uh, and, and living in a country. My, actually, having said that, my very first memories are of Singapore because my first primary school was in Singapore. I'm showing my age. When <laughs> I went to primary school, Singapore was still a British colony. Right. And my first school, the primary school I first went to when I was four or five years old, was in Singapore, and I lived in Singapore for three years. And my very first memories are of Singapore. And um, so I had that attachment, you know, historically, my own personal biography to, to this part of the world. And then during COVID, I started watching, like millions of other people, started watching those lucky individuals on their motorbikes or in their, in their vans doing van life or whatever they call it traveling exotic countries and so on, traveling the Silk Road. And I started thinking, like a lot of people, you know... Um, it's like a drug, isn't it? I mean, it's, yeah. you, you feel, especially with COVID, when people were locked in their uh, houses, their, their rooms, um, constrained, uh, weren't growing. And then you see these videos of people traveling the world. And, and I think, uh, if I, from my own experience, I think there was a shift in reality, mm. for want of a better uh, a description um, because you 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 think what is normal now has has disappeared. Yes, and you uh, you you start realizing normal can be anything you want, or mm. certainly it's got to be better than what we were having. Because most people, when they live in the moment, they live in that moment. And COVID, as a moment, was not uh, a moment where we we kind of grew as people. No, I think COVID broke. I mean, I think. In, in, in a positive and many negative, many, many negative senses. I mean, COVID was a terrible, terribly destructive event. And, and for me at the time, and I was surprised that people didn't talk about it, but when you think about it, and I think I'm right, COVID was more or less the only and first event that the entire world experienced. 
Absolutely. In different ways, in yes. different countries, very different experiences yes. for different people in different countries. But so far as I know, I mean, we've had world wars, but they've been world wars on uh, continents before, regional, you know, yes. regional. But still, even if they're big, like yeah. the Second World War with Pacific and Europe and so on, they've still been regional wars. But I think COVID, as far as I know, I think I'm right in saying, in terms of human history, it was the first human historically historical event which affected the whole of the world in different ways uh, to different people in different countries. But it was the first world event in that sense. I think there's been events that have affected, I mean, obviously Spanish flu, 50 million. But I think because of social media, this was something that was making us feel we're all united in this this uh, uh, yes, diabolical situation. You're, for you're right. And social media, I mean, and, and the power of media as a whole, yeah. because Spanish flu was after the First World War. Interestingly enough, it was called Spanish flu because of media, mm. because it was first reported in the newspapers of Spain at right. the time. That's why it got that name. Right. People think it started in Spain. It, what, it didn't. No. It was first reported in Spain in Spanish newspapers. That's why it got the name Spanish flu. But... Um, COVID itself and the whole way, and that's another discussion altogether, the whole way in which the virus was treated or not treated, the response in different countries and so on, in, in rich countries like Western Europe where I, or Central Europe where I was, countries where the governments could afford to give people money to stay at home and not go out to work, a luxury that people in this part of the world didn't have. Yes. You know, whatever the medical advice, they weren't able to Mm -hmm. stay at home. They had to go to the market or do whatever they had to do to live. To survive, yes. To survive. So that wasn't a luxury that many people had in other parts of the world. But but it did affect them. And, and the point, I think, is that there were it was a news story. Even if the response was different, and maybe that's the difference, again, to the Spanish flu, because that affected, it was a huge pandemic, a pandemic which affected many, many millions, more perhaps than even COVID. It wasn't known about. That's the big that's difference. Right. In this world where you go to the most remote village in uh, uh, who knows where in the world, people will pull out their smartphones and they've got their, they've got their Wi-Fi and their data connections. And theoretically, they can, they can be in touch with anybody on the other side of the world. That obviously wasn't the case in 1818 or yes. whenever when yes. the Spanish flu arrived. So, yeah, I mean, what I was saying about um, COVID, I think it changed... I think it made people, whether they wanted to or not, and not always in a positive way, made people look at their own lives mm. and 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 uh, wonder whether they were living the sort of life they ought to, and uh, whether it was, you know, the, whether it was the right, whether they should continue living the way they were. There's a phenomenon which um, I forget the name now given to it, but it was in in the USA. Uh, which people identified as being a COVID, a effect of COVID, is that millions of people in the U.S. left the workplace. They didn't they lose their jobs. Some of them did. They didn't have any choice about that. They lost their jobs. But they chose to leave the work they were doing. There was a big movement in the U.S., something I've read articles about, and it was basically provoked by COVID. I, th I think if, if, if I can interject, sometimes... Uh, we are, as cogs in the machine, we just turn and turn. And, you know, you get up, you go to work, you come home, you have dinner, you go to sleep, you get up. And because you're not having a reset or even, dare I say, a moment to think about what you're doing, you just do it um, on autopilot. COVID was that situation where actually you had to, because you couldn't go to work, you had to think. I mean, there were lots of people that suffered from depression because they weren't used to being alone. But there were others that took that opportunity to just reset their whole view on life. Um, yes. So it was, it, you're yes. right, it, it was, it was a bad... dramatic effect on yeah. many, many radical. And so, I mean, coming back, it's a long, you know, shaggy dog story to answer the question you asked me many minutes ago about how I ended up in Thailand. But I think I was also part of that process of thinking to myself, you know, uh, Prague is beautiful, Prague is wonderful. I have a lot of friends in Prague. I had, I don't know. Funnily enough, I was thinking today, I lived more than 30 years in Germany, but I, have, I lived seven years in Prague and I have far more friends in Prague. Not, actually only a few of them are, are Czechs, in fact, most of them are other foreigners, but it doesn't matter. I actually have far more friends 
made far more friends in Prague than I ever did in Germany. And I wondered to myself, would I lived in the wrong country most of my life? Yeah. But that's another, never be able to change that. But um, I think also sometimes yeah. the, the age you're at yes. makes you more friendly. Because uh, yeah. I, I honestly think some people, especially in the day and age we live in now, where, you know, to get ahead in this world, it, this dog-eat-dog dog world, you have to work really hard. Yes. And I think sometimes when you get to an age where, you know, you've worked hard, you've built something, you're a little more relaxed with yourself and they're yes. more relaxed around uh, other people, your surroundings. Yes. You, you, and and, and I, I guess that comes back down to this Thailand idea because there's a lot of people who have this misconception, I think, that people uh, people who are retiring come to Thailand for certain reasons. But actually, one of the main reasons that I've noticed that people come to re to Thailand is that one, it's an easy way of living. Yes. The sun, the vitamin D quotient you get in these countries means that you're a lot more happier than in colder environments. Mm. I know you mentioned earlier you kind of miss the snow in the in, in in Prague, but I'm pretty sure after a week or so you'd be wanting to come back to Thailand. Oh yeah, um, as a visitor, I, yeah. I think it's it's a place that's nice to be for a couple of cold winter nights. And this know. is one of those places yeah. where, as a Farang, a foreigner. Mm. I've noticed that you're actually liked, even as far as saying loved, uh, certainly respected more than probably any other country in the world. And there's another thing, and you mentioned it about, it's a st stage in life question. And, you know, yes. you've got, still got a good head of hair on you, but I lost, I used to joke with my, my ex-wife about losing my hair the, the, the day I married her. But... Um, uh, I have, uh, as you can see, very little hair on my head. What I was going to say is the respect thing about old people. That's one thing which uh, which you get in many Asian countries. You get this, this respect for the elderly. Uh, I have to classify, class myself. I'm the ancient biker after yeah. all. <laughs> yeah. so it makes no sense for me to pretend to be young when I call my channel Ancient Biker. Um, and that's supposed to be a reference to me. Maybe some of my viewers as well would also admit to being ancient. But anyway, it's, it's a reference to me. But if you're ancient, if you're old and you live in Thailand or many other Asian countries, you get that, and actually most Asian countries probably, when you yes, think about it. Yes, I think it, you're right. It's the sort of, I don't know if it's the Confucian or Buddhist or what other thing it is, or probably the same in Muslim countries as well. Yes, it is. Um, but yes, that definitely makes life easier. You get people literally sort of bowing to, before you because because you've got no hair on your head, yeah. and that definitely doesn't happen in Western Europe yes. where we come from. Yeah, or in fact, North in America. Western Europe, yeah. uh, I would say that elderly people are sometimes frightened to walk a street where they see a group of young people. Yes. Whereas, um, I mean, I I, I recollect a, an incident that happened in Japan. I was on a train in Japan. Uh, it wasn't the bullet train; it was just a local train, and. Um, I was sitting down and an elderly Japanese lady came and I got up and gave her my seat. Mm. And then uh, another person got up and I sat down and another elderly person came up and I got up. I think I got up about six times. And every time uh, uh, one of the elderly people who I got up for left, they would pat my back and rub my back. And I remember the first lady I got up for, she got up at the end and then she went on a rant to the young Japanese people. And really? like I have to make this point that Japanese people are very, very respectful, mm. very respectful. But she went and literally brandishing her fi finger, she said something to them, I don't speak Japanese, but I saw heads drop. And then when she left, she gave me a hug. And I, I realized, I, I thought, you know, what, what could she have said? And I, the only conclusion I could draw was that because I got up for the elderly, and even though there were other Japanese, and I'm a foreigner in Japan, she was embarrassing them that you should be getting up, not this chap, because I'm Japanese and you're Japanese. And I noticed that with, uh, I mean, I, I, I'm not saying that Japanese people wouldn't do that. Maybe that train had people that were, you know, I don't know, whatever. But I've noticed in Asia, you do get a lot of respect. Um, and, and the other thing I've noticed also, because I'm of a browner complexion, uh, I have Asian uh, parents. Um, it's not just if you're white, it doesn't matter what color you are. Mm. There is no racial bar here that mm. I've seen, certainly. Mm. And mm. I've been traveling, I've traveled 115 countries. Mm. And in Asia, I've never seen that at all. Yes. So you're absolutely right. I think when you're in, I wouldn't say you're uh, too far down the road of those twilight years, but 
Uh, who knows? Certainly, who knows? certainly when you're a little bit uh, older and a little bit yeah. wiser for it, yeah. Uh, yeah. it's nice to be in an environment where yeah. you're given respect regardless of what you say, just yeah. for your existence, yeah. which I think in the Western world yeah, doesn't that, exist. That's, that's a big cultural difference here. And, yeah. you know, sometimes you said you don't speak Japanese and my Thai is very rudimentary. I did a one-year Thai education visa to learn Thai and I still confess that my Thai is very, very basic after one year. Sometimes, and I thought the same living in Prague and not speaking Czech, it can be an advantage not to speak the local language. Mm. Because sometimes we get a better impression if we don't hear what people are saying about us. That's, That's also true. true. That's true, yeah. yeah. So who knows what some of those Thai yeah. people may have been saying yeah. about me or some of those Czech people said about me yeah. when I lived in Prague. Or maybe what some of those Japanese people said about you when you lived in but, Japan. I, but I would always say that, uh, uh, you know, with language, you can articulate in a way uh, that you hide the truth, but body language is yes. very hard yes. to manipulate. Yes. So you, I mean, I I come to Thailand to, to support orphanages, and I and I see the way people look at me, and and in their eyes you can see they just have a level of happiness just seeing me, and that I, you know, maybe don't see in the West so much. You know, yeah. I yeah. mean, the, 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 I don't want to. Um, draw a line through all of the West because yeah. I do find that the Mediterranean are very different. Yes. They, you know, yeah. grandparents are with grandchildren and they mingle and mix. And maybe if I'm being uh, honest, it's maybe uh, certain countries of the West. We won't mention some of them because I belong to one of them. But yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. but again, even that I would say, because you have Welsh heritage. I've noticed when I'm in Wales or I'm in Scotland, but particularly in Wales, the people are so much more friendlier. Mm. Um, than say when I'm in England, even though yes. I was born in England. So I don't know. Maybe it's, it's maybe that's part of the big city uh, country possibly. type uh, yes. dichotomy. But actually, coming back to your question, because it's an interesting one to me also about Thailand. I started, as I said during COVID, watching an awful lot of. Well, that's when I first sort of signed up as a heavy user of YouTube. And actually, one of the first decisions I made made, and I shouldn't make the advertising. I shouldn't advertise for Google or YouTube, but. I became a premium user of, of YouTube pretty quickly to avoid, in those days, the awful Czech adverts that I had to watch otherwise. Um, and that's a decision I didn't regret, not having some of the fantastic material on YouTube interrupted by awful advertising. But I, um, yeah, I started watching a lot of those, a lot of travel programs, not just motorbike, not just um, uh, itchy boots, not just your channel, um, traveling across Asia, um, but um, just general travel uh, uh, programs. And in fact, the country and the region I was looking at during COVID and thinking about maybe that's a place worth considering to live was Malaysia. And I had my eye originally on Borneo, on, on uh, Kuching in Sarawak, in the south of Malaysian Borneo. Uh, where I had been before, I've been a couple of times, uh, a very special city in the rainforest in the south uh, of the Malaysian Borneo. And then I thought, well, maybe it'd be more useful, more practical to live on the mainland of Malaysia, not on Borneo. And then I don't, didn't need to want to live in a big city like Kuala Lumpur. I had that, my eye set on, uh, on Malacca, which is an old historical yes, city Christian, yeah, yeah. on the coast of yeah. Malaysia, on the Malacca Straits. Yes which had been originally colonized by the Portuguese. It yeah. still has a Portuguese community. In yeah. Fact. And anyway, that, that beautiful church that it's well, yes. well known for. It's, it's a very historical, interesting, relatively small city. Yes. That's one of the things that appealed to me about Prague. It's a sm relatively small city, but has a lot going on. So you've got yeah. the benefits of, of, uh, of things to do and places to go and people to meet and so on, but not being a huge metropolis, which Kuala Lumpur, for example, or Bangkok would be more like. Anyway, long story short, I came, I came to Thailand at the end uh, of 2021 as COVID was coming to an end. And Thailand at the time in November 21 was the first country, as far as I know, in Asia to open its doors to, to tourism, to yes. foreigners. 20% of its GDP is based well, on yes. tourism, so they, they, were, they were suffering. They were so I came here... Hemorrhaging. For that reason, basically, because it was the first port of call, I thought I was on my way to, to Malaysia. I thought I was on my way to Malacca. Yes. 
or at least somewhere in Malaysia to check out the country as a place to live. Yeah. Maybe short term, maybe long term. Originally, I think when I came to Thailand or came, yeah, I came to Asia, it was just getting into the warmth again, getting out of the, it was the end of the year in Prague. It was probably, there was probably ice and snow on the ground. Um, and I was thinking of, you know, getting into the warmer climes again. But in the back of my mind, at least, was the idea of relocating maybe permanently to Malaysia, to somewhere in Asia. And also because Malaysia in particular is one of those places in Asia where English is an official language, like yes. Singapore and maybe a couple of other parts of, of Asia. Philippines, I think the same, is an official language. And from traveling in Thailand in the past, I'm going back 30 years and more, English was not widely spoken. Yes, it's changed and considerably. If you traveled, especially up here in the provinces, it was very difficult sometimes to communicate because very few people spoke English. So one of the attractions to me of the idea of living in Malaysia was the ease of using English, not having to learn Malay. Anyway, I never ended up in Malaysia. I never went and haven't been there since I came to Asia two years ago because Malaysia, like most of Asia, didn't open its doors for a long time after I came to Thailand. Right. So the reason I ended up in Thailand was almost a sort of accident. Yeah, potluck reason. Yeah, I came to Phuket as I had to. That was the only way at the time to get into the country. You had to do a one That's week. That's right, and you had to stay um, in. What do they call it? Um, what do they call that again with COVID? Uh, uh, you know, where you have to stay indoors. What do they call that again? I forget. Uh, the, I can't remember. Forget also, the word. You know. Yeah, it's it's quarantine. Um, quarantine. Yeah. That's what a quarantine. I had to do the one week compulsory quarantine in Phuket which I don't particularly like. It's, it's, there are too many tourists and too many foreigners and too expensive for me. So I went to Phuket for one week, the obligatory week, and then got out north as soon as I could up to Chiang Mai. And I wasn't originally, when I arrived in Chiang Mai in November two years ago, I wasn't thinking of, of, of living there. But very quickly, and of course I arrived at the wonderful, in the wonderful uh, uh, northern Thai winter, where the rain stops for three months and the temperatures drop below 30. And I very quickly and easily found a very nice place to live and also a very cheap place to live. And after literally about a month, I thought to myself, I could live here. This will be a nice, this will be a good place to live. Um, quality of life, ease of getting around without speaking Thai, which I thought would have been, would have been a huge problem. Uh, okay. Chiang Mai is the second biggest Thailand, uh, city in Thailand, and uh, it's very well developed and for tourism and so on as well, and for foreigners. But um, it but still has a sorry. charm. It still has a charm. Yes, it does. And like you said, with Prague, it's a big city, but it feels well, homely. And I think it's a medium-sized city. It's not actually big. I mean, especially in yeah. Asian terms, it's yeah. not big. Yeah. If you look at those cities in China. Yeah. Those third-tier cities in China, which have 10 million inhabitants, yeah. that yeah. people in the West have never heard of. Yes. Right. Literally, never yeah. heard of. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, compared with some of those big Asian cities in, in, you know, in Asia, in other parts of Asia, Ch Chiang Mai is not a big city, but it's, it offers what I need, at least. Um, Something, sorry, you yeah. touched on, which I, I, th yeah. I think is, is worth mentioning. Uh, we spoke about it in more detail yesterday outside the interview. Um, but there's, there's obviously going to be people that are watching this video uh, that may have a, a desire, a wish to come over to Thailand for either... Um, short-term living or possibly even long-term living. And one thing that you you mentioned, I, I'm pretty sure it was yourself who mentioned, which is a very valid point. And uh, the point was that uh, gas bills, say, for example, in the UK, are literally the same cost as renting an apartment in Thailand. Certainly in North Thailand, maybe not so much yeah. in South Thailand. So one of the things that a lot of people maybe do not appreciate about Thailand is that your money goes so much further yes. than, say, if you're in the West, particularly yes. England. Because let's be honest, England uh, is a, a little more expensive than some of the other countries in, in the West. Um, and, and I think that's something that people need to appreciate, yes. that when they yes. come here, you know, uh, the British pension, most pensions in Europe aren't that great, state pensions certainly. Um, and so if you want your, uh, I don't want to say buck because it's not a, but you want your euro or your, your pound, pound to go further than these places oh, are yes. absolutely fantastic. Yes. And another add-on to that is um, yesterday we met a chap called Tony, another expat. Uh, at 72, he was looking very chirpy physically and mentally. 
And that's another thing that most people who come to these warmer climates seem to feel more healthier, be more healthier. And obviously there's no stats to prove this, but I'm pretty sure they have a longer life. Possibly. I think it depends a little bit, of course, on their lifestyle here. Of course. I mean, um, there are expats, uh, foreigners, uh, who come who relocate to Thailand and, and choose, and that's their right to do so, choose to spend all their spare cash on, on you know, on, on local beers and prop up various bars and yes, yes. Uh, stools, you know, uh, whatever in bars uh, seven days a week. And yeah. I'm not sure about their life uh, prognosis, Ex yeah, yeah, yeah. expectation, but I mean, I, for whatever reason, I, uh, that's one of the big differences in my lifestyle in Prague. Local beers were very much part of my lifestyle. It's something that's missing here and I don't regret it. It's a, a decision I made to, um, to, to basically stop stop drinking here and I think it's in this climate at least it's good for me um, if if I if I lived the way that some people do some other foreigners I'm not sure it would increase my life expectancy necessarily would but you, you're right would, it can be good for you would you recommend good. Thailand to people that are considering this considering what as in a, a, a major move in other well, words yeah, of course I mean I, I chose to do it. it wasn't just because the other countries weren't available weren't open and in retrospect I think I made the right decision even if I know. I don't know what would have happened if Malaysia had been open for me when I came two years ago, and I had gone down there. Whether or not I would have stayed there, and whether it would have been better for me than here, I don't know. Um, but certainly, I, I love it here. And um, coming back to you know lifestyle and, and, and choices and so on. Um, yes, you were just talking about cost of living. Let's be honest about it. That's for most foreigners, most expats in Thailand. Uh, in you know uh, that is for most of them i don't know what percentage whether it's 50 or it's 60 70 or 80 percent that is the single biggest reason that they've chosen to move here mm -hmm. um and you're quite right i mean i have a beautiful house as you have seen yes, here definitely uh on two the bedroom, outskirts, two, bathroom. two bedrooms two bathrooms 100 square meters for people to know what that means um with a bit of land around it i'm right in the middle of the rice fields and I'm about five minutes from the center of the city on my motorbike. And do you want to share what you're paying in rent? Because oh, I, I know when I, I was, I had to sit down. <laughs> Otherwise, I would have fallen down. I'm paying less. I know I'm paying less than most people in Europe are paying on their heating bills. Yeah. Uh, this, this winter, I'm paying the equivalent of 140 euros or dollars. Pounds are much the same, I think, these days for my rent. Yeah. Water is free. Pounds. Water yeah. is free because it's coming from a well. From the, it's, it's a, a water out of the ground. And my uh, just to finish the equation for you, my 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 bills every month. And I must say I don't use air conditioning because I don't. It doesn't agree with me. I prefer to use fans. But my monthly electricity bill comes to about thirty dollars. So in other words, my total monthly expenses for it's about one hundred and fifty pounds. Yeah. For it's everything. ridiculous. For everything. Yeah. I just, just so that viewers understand, uh, my daughter has started a, a job as a mechanical engineer in London. And for her room, uh, which I believe is en suite, so it might be a little more expensive because of that, in Canary Wharf is just over a thousand pounds a month. So it's kind of, when you look at it in that way, it's not just ridiculous, it's, it's, it's a godsend for people who really have no. Um, affinity to a particular place but just want to live the rest of their life comfortably and in a way that they can afford to live well. Yes, and just across out of the window out down there, um, there are plots waiting to be built on. Um, little houses that haven't been built yet but there are pictures of them on the plot and the price of 1.69 million baht, which to put that back into sort of currencies that people know about, I guess is what, $40,000? Yeah. And just so that all yeah. those that are expats or um, people from the West, um, we we can't buy land or a house, but we can buy apartments and apartments are even cheaper. So I'm not sure, I, I know there's apartments in Chiang Mai. Are there apartments in Chiang Mai? Oh, I'm sure there are apartments everywhere. Yeah. Obviously you pay, you pay, you know, if you go to Phuket, Go to a, an upmarket resort area in Phuket, you'll probably be paying almost North American or European prices. You know? yes. But that as but, doesn't but appeal I, to I, me. I, but up here in Chiang Mai or Chiang Rai or up in the provinces, 
Uh, you're right. Condominiums, any person can buy. Yes. There are ways around. I mean, we, we, we there are people here, the, the main, the normal way uh, which foreigners end up owning uh, a house or land Set is because they're married. No, no, actually oh. because they're married to a Thai yes. lady. Yeah. So it's actually in her name. Yeah. There are other ways around. You make lease contracts and things. There are ways around that That's right. restriction on foreigners owning. That's actually one of the... One of the differences with Malaysia, and one of the reasons I was looking at Malaysia, so far as I know, it's the only country in Southeast Asia where foreigners can own land and own houses. It's not true in uh, other parts of, of I Asia. I think Cambodia you're allowed, okay. but, but, but uh, uh, some of the countries that did allow that are now having uh, the trouble of realizing that prices have gone through the roof because of Chinese investment, and locals can't buy uh, land that their forefathers lived on. So I think what Thailand does is, for me, I think it's very unique and it's the right thing to do. I mean, an apartment, most people who want to come here want to live for retirement. So an apartment is quite nice. Oh, and yes. Especially some apartments where you've got other expats, you've got a little fraternity, yeah. yeah. ready-made, made to measure, you, for want of a uh, better description. I keep saying that, but I don't know why that's now just regurgitating on my mouth. But um, but also, uh, the, the apartments that I've seen in Chiang Mai, uh, they're from um, 20,000 up to 25,000 pounds. And these are really good apartments. Really? So it's not actually that expensive. Okay, I haven't, I haven't yeah. looked at them. But um, uh, one of the reasons I wanted to move into a house, in fact, I was in a townhouse originally here in Chiang Rai and moved into this house. It's a, it's a detached house with a little bit of land around it and, and rice fields all around. So nobody gets disturbed when you play your discotheque and do when your I dancing. When I get my, it's, it's more Beethoven than, than, <laughs> okay. uh, than, than uh, what's the other rock word? Or heavy metal. Heavy metal. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, when I turn up the, um, turn up the, the speakers over there, my neighbors aren't too close. So they're not going to be yeah. complaining so much. And, and the surrounding. I mean, I've yeah. seen this. It's, it's a wonderful surrounding. Yes. Um, wonderful. Speaking of surrounding, I want to bring yeah. uh, us to um, the next question I have. Now, I've been riding for 37 years. You told me you've been riding for two years. Yeah. But I actually think you're a braver man than I am. Because I started when I was 12, right? Yeah. And so you progress because it's something that you know. But when you start two years ago at the age, we won't mention, but the age that you uh, did. Um, advanced stage in uh, life. Yes. It's, it's, it's a bigger decision. Big, is maybe. it not? I don't know. Um, maybe. I, I, I don't know. I rode... I drove cars most of my life, nice cars, very good cars, most of them company cars for most of my life, and and living in Germany, the you know one of those car few places. which has four wheels, four brakes, and a shell that protects you. Oh yes, a bike which but a, often... in a country where you could theoretically drive as fast as you want, and some yes. roads at least. Yeah. But that's the special thing about Germany, and I was used to driving very fast in my fast cars. Um, but yeah, I'm. Um, and then living in Prague, actually, the interlude was Prague, which was a city where, frankly, it makes no sense to own a car because the best and quickest way, easiest way public to, is public transport. Yes. It's a 24-hour public transport system, which particularly shames anything the British regard as a public transport. Well, they don't really hardly have any public transport in Britain. But it's a wonderful tram system in Prague. And so I didn't have a car for seven years in Prague, and I didn't miss one either. Um, but And here, of course, we're in a country where most people... The main, the, the major, uh, biggest mode of transport is the two-wheel transport. Is yes. a little, right. a little small motorbike. And, and just to add, uh, I mean, I, I ride uh, all over Asia, and I can tell you this: that um, the people who drive vehicles, cars, uh, pickup trucks, s seem to be very uh, caring and compassionate to two-wheel mo a two-wheel mode of transport. You don't see that in Vietnam. You I don't think see in that some in... countries more than others. Yeah, Vietnam yeah. is notorious yeah. for being having even aggressive Philippines, drivers. In the Philippines, I didn't see that. Yeah. I never saw that in Cambodia. I didn't see yes. that in Laos. Yes, the Thais um, are probably... A... Yeah. Well, having said that, as you probably know, this country has the dubious distinction of having the highest uh, uh, rate of road fatalities in the world. Right. Number one. It's not a proud um, distinction for Thailand, but it is, in fact, the number one country for road deaths, right. um, which is partly a result of the, fa the reflection of the fact that most people are not in cars without metal box around them. They are yes. actually more likely to be yes. on a heavily overloaded 
moped, maybe with half the or the whole family on it. With yes, them. that's true. You get those four or five on one yeah, yeah. small bike here. I, I was told and without helmets. Yes, that's the other that's big the, thing in Thailand. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. they're supposed to wear one, but I think on average, and I think in Vietnam them. people do wear helmets. And, yes. and I think head injury is probably one of the main cause of death. In fact, I was speaking to somebody two days ago, and one of their uh, colleagues, a teacher, a crew, uh, had an accident in Chiang Rai and died. So this was only two, three days ago, and they were on a motorcycle. They hit a truck or a truck hit them. The other thing I was told, I remember, and this is for anybody who does choose to ride in in, um, in Thailand, is that when you go into rural areas, you find a lot of people uh, in the evening, drink alcohol, want to be merry, and um, they can sometimes be using roads when they shouldn't be using roads. And that sometimes can cause... Uh, fatalities I or hazards so. on the road. I, I, Because I, I ride both in the day and night, and I've noticed uh, at night you see certain people and the fact that they're riding in uh, uh, a fashion which uh, leaves a, a snake route on the road kind of makes me think they're not sober. Yeah, yeah, that um, could be part of the culture yeah. as well here. But but yeah, um, no, I don't know how brave. Uh, my uh, Coming back to your suggestion, I'm particularly brave to ride. I did actually... Take the trouble of learning in Europe, in Prague, to ride a motorbike and actually get a proper, full European motorbike license. Um, so I guess I am different, for actually, not only from a, most Thais, but also from a lot of foreigners here, too, who don't have any sort of license or have never learned officially yes. to ride a bike or, or drive a car. Okay, foreigners tend to have a driving license, but Thais, I don't think most of them have ever been in a driving school or had a driving lesson. And apparently, I think the official way to get a driving license in Thailand is to watch a video. Okay. That's how you qualify for, as a driver. You watch a 45-minute video, right. and you answer some questions. You pay a little bit of money and get a photograph taken. And that's your, right. how you qualify as a driver in yeah. Thailand. And I think most people on bikes of various sorts have never been yes. near a, a you know, riding school, driving school, whatever. So I did that in Prague immediately before I uh, came at the end of 21. I actually spent two months doing lessons and yeah. doing a, getting a driving a, ri a license. So I had a certain confidence from, from having been taught the very basics. But to be fair, of course, as soon as I got on a bike... Out the window. And went out of the city, yeah. out of Chiang Mai, and up into the hills and mountains here in northern Thailand on those twisty mountain roads. My driving school, for good reason, in Prague, there are no twisty mountain yes, roads yes, in Prague. Yes, yeah. I've never been any on any roads like those before. Yeah. So my real experience and the little I've learned how to, you know, ride a bike properly, has been acquired here, not jumping in, the in the deep school. end rather yeah. than. But less. I had that basis. At least yeah, I learned yeah. sort of basics of, of 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 controlling a motorbike and doing those figures of eight and so on in order to qualify. Um, but my real, I would say, perhaps. Uh, brave intention, if if not, nothing else, is my ambition to do the long trip that you have done more than once yes. from Europe to somewhere like the border of China on a motorbike. I don't know when, whether it be next year or perhaps the year after, if I'm still around. And that's actually the background to my channel to get prepared for that yes. uh, trip where I want to go from somewhere in Europe, possibly from the UK, maybe from Prague, and ride down through Turkey, through Iran, which I'm really looking forward to because I've heard it's such a wonderful country. It's, it's if I'm, I mean, as, as I mentioned earlier, I've traveled 115 countries yes. and I've never yet found a country that's more hospitable Well, that's Iran. what I've heard, you know. Yeah. Actually, a uh, confession to make, before COVID and before I even thought about motorbikes and things, I had originally had an, a, a thought in my brain which never developed beyond that to ride a bicycle, a push bike, to do the same sort of thing with a push bike. Yes. And actually bought myself quite a nice long distance touring I, bike. I still have that plan, but I, yeah. I, I, my physicality means that it'd be really difficult. So what I did was I, I actually, it's still in the planning stages. I, I purchased an electric bike. Oh yeah. And I've got three batteries. So basically with power assist, not full throttle, yeah, just power assist. Yeah. You know, there's, there's gonna be places where the terrain is tough and you gotta yeah. climb up. Uh, ride up hills, and and I'm yes. not sure I I could do a hundred kilometers doing that kind of terrain. Yeah. So, but using the three batteries, 
I could probably generate power systems cover maybe 150 kilometers a day. Yes. Uh, until that time when my fitness level is much better and I use the batteries less uh, yeah. uh, and, and, and less. Um, but again, I, I, having seen other cyclists do this trip, and I met some of them in Europe and I met some of them in Pakistan, I met some of them in, in, uh, in Iran. Uh, one, you've got to have a passion for riding bicycles. And the one thing that was clear was that all those cyclists were really young. Yeah. And, and I think, I, I'm not saying a person who has um, maybe been weathered by life and is showing in age can't do that. But I certainly think it's a challenge that's yeah, really, Yeah, it's more really of a physical difficult. challenge, obviously, yeah. as you get older. Yeah. But what I was thinking of, of when I mentioned that about the bicycle is only that I, again, in the same sort of way that I started watching loads of YouTube videos during COVID and started dreaming of traveling and moving and so on. The same sort of, I went through the same sort of experience when I was starting, when I thought about riding a bicycle, a push bike across the world. In those days, it wasn't YouTube, it was more reading books. And I, I read accounts. I read books yes. written by people who'd done those bicycle trips. Yeah. And one of the things that I learned from reading those books was that the one single country in the world that all of those people who'd been there said was the best country Iran. to ride in was Iran. Yes. The hospitality, they would be literally dragged off their bikes yeah. into people's houses and Absolutely. told, you are not leaving here until you've eaten dinner with yeah. us. Yeah. You're not even leaving here tonight because we've got a room for you. We've yeah. got a bed for you. For sure. And that was the thing that remained in my mind. Yeah. One of the side effects, benefits of having my Irish passport is that yes. unlike my British passport, where for very good reason I'm not allowed into Iran. Um, this is the country that organized the coup against their democratically elected leader in 1955, I think it was, Mossadegh. Was it oh, Mossadegh? Yeah. Anyway, the British have not been good to the Iranians. The British and the Americans, obviously. And the Americans, of course, Iran, the, yeah. of course, the Americans. Yeah. But I wouldn't be allowed into Iran. Uh, I don't think they have diplomatic relations, a proper, a full yes. diplomatic relation between Britain and Iran, but the supposedly neutral Irish, Yeah, uh, we don't have that problem with my Irish passport. I can travel to Iran. To, to be honest, um, Ireland is actually looked favorably, so much favorably in Muslim countries than any other Western country yes. on, on, this, on this planet. Yeah. Um, certainly recent times with the genocide that's taken place in Palestine, yes. uh, how vocal the Irish government has been yes. over this. It's, yeah. it's clear. Well, they have a shared history of colonialism, of yes. being colonial yes. uh, subjects yes. and, and, uh, and suffering yes. from colonization. So I think sure. that's the reason. Yeah. You're quite right. In Ireland, there's far more uh, organized uh, support and sympathy for the Palestinians than certainly in the UK. And yeah. that's partly because of their shared history of, of being, uh, uh, being uh, uh, you know, suffering from British colonialism. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's so. funny, I, I remember uh, saying or a little prompt in a Kilburn pub, yeah. an Irish pub in Kilburn in London. And it said there, and which I think is very uh, relevant for Iran, it said, there are no strangers here, just friends that haven't yet met. <laughs> and uh, honestly speaking, uh, not just Iran, I think in Asia, mm. that is true. Mm. Uh, in Asia, I mean, I've been to um, the, the island of Borneo, I've done most of Asia. I'm thinking the only country I haven't traveled properly is China mm. uh, and Mongolia. Otherwise, mm. I've done every country in Asia. Mm. Um, I've done uh, all of Europe. I've done lots of countries in Africa. And, and one thing about Asian people is um, maybe it's from the, the past where you know, they were under European rule, that they still look at Europeans in a more favorable light, which I don't know why they would, but they do. Uh, and I'm not going to knock that. But yeah, it's it's one of those countries. And Iran is definitely one of those countries, probably one of the prominent ones, where really they're very, they're so friendly. You kind of think, because we come from a Western background, we think, what do they want? Is yeah. an ulterior motive. But I've traveled through Iran extensively. And I can yeah. tell you now, there's never been an ulterior motive, other than the fact that I just want to show you their hospital. Well, I think, I mean, we had earlier in our discussion, we talked about the difference between Asia and Europe and uh, the question of respect and so on. But I think in a very general sense, uh, 
and that goes for many countries, not just in Asia, probably in Africa, probably in South America as well, for sure. In many countries and many cultures, it's ingrained in their own culture to show... Respect the elderly. No, not just respect. I'm thinking about hospitality. Oh, yes. The idea of being hospitable towards strangers yes. or visitors yes. is ingrained in the cultures of many, many yes. countries. Maybe less so in advanced countries, in the North America or in yes. Western Europe but much more so in Asia, perhaps in Africa. I don't know Africa well. And South America may be the same. So I think that's a general thing about, actually, I would say, as a very big generalization, but perhaps one that still rings true, poorer countries generally, countries that aren't so economically advanced, the level of, and you must have experienced this from right. your travels. I think you know? poorer people have less. So what they have, they offer. So in relative terms what they offer is substantially more than somebody who's well to do mm. you know uh, if, if somebody brings you into their home and they barely make ends meet and they offer you a meal a place to stay whereas you've got other people who are you know very very rich in comparison and they wouldn't offer you a cup of tea yes you know you'd have to ask for a glass of water so yeah i i, I think you're absolutely right you hit the nail on the head i think sometimes uh, the poorer the person the richer the heart Yes. Uh, the richer the person, the poorer the heart. Sadly, yeah. yes. Uh, that's and if you go by gospel or religion, they say a rich man to go to heaven is like putting a camel through the eye of a needle. needle yes. And yeah. you know we see that now because let's yeah. be honest, uh, the world is run by corporates and governments and yeah, certain world rich is, countries. And the world is in a terrible mess and is run by the rich. Very rich. It's run yeah. by the oligarchs that nobody talks about. Yeah. Yeah. That's the big story which nobody is talking yeah. about. That's the big story which the, the, is, this, you this know... This idea of one percenters, people talk about it, but only as in it's a fictional thing. I mean... But it, it can't be. Nine people yeah. own more than half of the USA. Nine people Ridiculous. have more than half of the wealth of the USA. Yeah. Why isn't that the front page story? Well, it's partly because they also own the well, media. The media, yeah, yeah for sure. Let's, I mean, yeah. that's what it's about. That, nobody's yeah. talking about it. Yeah. Nobody's really talking yeah. about that. But that should be a huge story. How can sure. nine people own half of the richest country in the world, yeah. the most powerful yeah. country in the world, and yeah. in my personal opinion, the most dangerous country in the world, yes. is owned by nine people. Yeah. Half of it owned yeah. by nine people. And if you look at the, the world, I'm pretty sure it's going to be a couple of dozen people that own more than half of the world. Yeah, yeah. It is uh, literally. Yeah. But those, that's a story which is not. If yeah. it's mentioned, it's mentioned as a sort of tri example of trivia, you know, yeah, trivial yeah. pursuit. Yeah, yeah. But it's at the heart, I think, of, the, of the problems that, yeah. we, that billions of us yeah. encounter in the world today. The fact Capitalism that was supposed to be a motivational fact for people to work hard, mm -hmm. not uh, a point where people lose humanity. And I think uh, there are people who have gone to a point in this capitalist world where humanity is lost, um, uh, but also uh, money is, m it's not the root of all evil, it is evil. Yeah. Well, they're driven by yeah. wealth. The yeah. And people who have who've got more than they could need in a thousand lives. Yeah. Really, you know, yes, if you're yeah. a billionaire, yeah. even yeah. one as a one, one billion billionaire, yeah. you've got more than a thousand yeah. of you could ever need, or you could Absolutely. need in a thousand lives or a thousand yeah. years or a hundred thousand years. Yeah. But they still want more. Yeah. They still want more. They want more from their Raytheon shares and their general dynamic shares. Yeah. And they want more wars to make yeah. more money with their yeah. investment in the in the war machine, you know. Yeah. Uh, that's more important to them than what's happening in yeah. the Middle East. I, 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 this was coined, um, well, it was used by John F. Kay, but I think it originally came from Abraham Lincoln. Mm. And he said, uh, you know, politicians should be of the people, by the people, for the people. And I, I was thinking, if you look at all the governments around the world, for the last 100, maybe even 200 years, that's never been the case. No. Nobody is in power of the people. And you can't say by the people, because though the people vote in, if, you're, if the choice is between uh, the devil and Satan, you know, you're going to choose one that's evil, you know? Yeah. And, and but, I, but, I, but, but look at the countries that claim to be so democratic and... Yeah. Examples to the world, exceptional countries. And look at the USA. You have two massive parties which are both owned and controlled by the same people. Yes. And 
in the same interests. Yes. They both serve yes. a tiny, tiny, tiny yeah. elite yeah. of less than 1% yeah. who own and control the it, state. It, it, and again, they control, they are, they are owned by those yes. people, by those corporations. And, yeah. it, and it's perfectly legal in the USA yeah. for the parties to be bought yeah. by big interests. By corporates. By yeah. corporates. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, by the war machine and so yeah. on, they own the parties, yeah. and they own the media as well. Yes. As they yeah. they so own and control they, the media. And and it's true. They say uh, history is always written by the uh, the victors. And so, if you are in power, everything that comes through the media is going to be. Uh, it's going to paint a picture where you're the saint, and everyone else is the sinner. And I, let's be honest. I mean, uh, one of the things I found out whilst I was traveling in a city called Karachi was that some of the pharmaceutical companies there produce medicine for America. And I remember once uh, looking at certain medicines because the person who owned the pharmaceutical company, uh, a, a billionaire, he was in a, a 4 by 4 rally. And I was there as well as a guest. Uh, and I started talking to him. Uh, I, I actually, how I spoke to him was I was insulting him because he was being very aggressive to it the normal people, his staff. I mean, he was very arrogant. And I sort of kind of uh, ridiculed him, but in a jovial way that made the other people laugh. So he wanted to know who I was. And when I started asking him and we started talking about medicines and whatnot, and it was ridiculous that like, for example, um, statins, mm -hmm. um, it cost a pack of 100 statins 10p. Mm. Yet, if you were to buy those in America, that would be hundreds of dollars. Yes. And it, the markup that pharmaceutical companies put up, and it, you know, it's just, it's absolutely ridiculous. And, mm. and so that's, that proves that corporates are literally, I don't want to use the word, but they rape people. You know, it might not be sexual rape, but it's rape of their well, they soul. Control, and, they control yeah. the world, you know, they control especially the Western world. Yeah. Um, you know, and I suppose coming back to your questions about Thailand, I have a feeling it's a bit obviously illusory because I don't think Thailand is not an island, you know. Uh, this is part of the big, that big sort of, what do they call it, rules-based order, mm. which means we make the rules and you follow our orders. That's what rules-based order is, isn't it? Mm. One country makes the rules, tries to, and one country tries to make everybody else follow their orders. We know who which country mm, yes, I'm talking yeah. about there. Yeah. And they call that the rules-based order. So that country has two parties which are both owned by a small number of very, very rich and powerful people and corporations. Yes. We have this thing, thing in the UK where all the political parties, again, they all serve the same people. Um, and you have an electoral system in the UK, and I don't even think most British people are aware of it, where typically, typically, more than 60% of all the votes cast, not people who could vote but don't choose to, but people who actually vote. More than 60% of all the votes which are cast in general elections in the UK are worthless. They have no effect at all on the outcome of the election. They go straight in the bin because they're for candidates in the local constituencies who don't win in that constituency. And since there's only one vote in the UK with their so-called first past the post system. Uh, it means that if you have a multi-party democracy, that's what they call it in the UK, and you have five parties and they share the votes between them, typically the one who wins gets maybe 35% of the vote, mm -hmm. which means 65% of those votes go straight in the bin. Yeah, has, they has. have absolutely no effect on the outcome yeah. of the election. So governments, and of course, then you have massive government majorities I think foreigners, when they look at the British governments and they think, oh, they've got a huge majority, they must be very popular because they've got 70% of the MPs in Parliament. Yeah. No, they've got 30, 45%, 40% of the share of the vote, but they have 70% of the, uh, of the members of Parliament yeah. because of the electoral system, yeah. which is fundamentally undemocratic. And I don't even think British people are aware of that, yeah. let alone foreigners. So, you know, democracy is a very... I mean, I think living also in a country which has a recent history of military coups and yeah. governments which don't even claim to be particularly democratic, I think it relativizes the idea of democracy. Yeah, I, I think I, I would say certainly with Britain, uh, democracy is availed 
cover up the autocracy that it, it's run under. I mean, um, I was uh, reading something about David Cameron that David Cameron's family uh, was in slavery. Oh yeah, and they gave up slavery because there was a statute that was passed, and they were compensated twenty million yes. pounds back in eighteen or whatever it was. The slave yeah. owners were compensated, yeah. but not the slaves. Yeah, and then the, the final payment for that compensation, because the government couldn't pay all of that money, it would pay in tranches over time, it was in 2015. Yes. So his family received money for the compensation of slavery up to 2015. And that's not common knowledge. And it's not shared because, as you said, the people who control the country also control the media. Yes. And they choose what to put in the and media. And as you said, it's, history is written by the victors. Yeah. And I remember from my privileged school background that we, I remember history lessons talking about the slave trade but or about slavery but actually the funny thing is it's not very funny but and i think it's typical for the way in which history about of slavery is taught in britain which was a major slave owning and slave profiting economy is that they teach a great deal about the abolition of slavery mm. and the pioneers of the abolition yes. of slavery but actually they say very little about those that started the practice it, of slavery yeah. Yeah. and you know, what came before them yeah um, there's a great deal talked about the, you know, those ab abolitionists, those uh, worthy people who, who campaigned to ab abolish yeah. slavery. But actually very little is taught about mm. the fact that, you know, Bristol, Liverpool, other yes. big cities in the UK were built on slavery. Yes. The British economy at the time was built on slavery and on the slave trade between the, uh, the Caribbean, uh, North America and mm. ports like Liverpool. And that's hardly talked about, but they yeah. talk a great deal about the abolition, the pioneering yes. uh, uh, abolitionists, the British abolitionists of, of slavery. Um, so yeah, that's how, that's how history, history is taught, you know, um, that's how it is. Um, so, but I think, and you've traveled across a lot of those countries, which again, don't claim to be, and are not regarded as great democracies, the ones that you've traveled through. I think at the end of the day, for most normal, ordinary people who, you know, literally scrape a living and uh, struggling from survive, one day to... Yeah. For what I think, you know, rightly or wrongly, I think for them, what decides for them whether they live in a good country or a bad country or have a good government or a bad co government is whether to the degree to, it, degree to which they, 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 they can organize their lives and survive. Yes. Yeah. And I think, unfortunately, and that's certainly true for a lot of Asia, it has little or nothing to do with the, whether or not their government is, uh, subscribes to the parliamentary democratic system Quite right, of yeah. North America or yeah. the UK, for example. Yeah. Uh, you know, when I, when I look at China today, seriously, I cannot imagine an average Chinese person saying, if only we had a system that allowed us to elect a president like President Biden. Yes. Or have somebody like, yeah. uh, uh, like the, uh, the uh, what do they call them, State uh, Blinken, mm. Secretary of State Blinken. Or in the Europe, Ursula von der Leyen. If only we had politicians yeah. like these. Yeah. You know? And who, who, who have who been support, shown. Who support genocide yes, in the Middle East. Yeah. If only we were a democracy yeah, yeah. and could elect politicians who support and fine and fund and fund and finance genocide yeah if only we were democracies yeah. and had the, and this had is, those freedoms this is the issue now that i think with the west they've perpetrated a lie at such a length and for so long they actually believe their own lie oh many people i mean do, yes. uh, i was um, i was listening to uh, uh, a gentleman uh, his name eludes me right now but basically he said that the people have no power mm. you know um uh noam uh, what's his name uh chomsky chomsky no i'm chomsky yeah so and he was absolutely right he says you people have no people have no power mm. the governments are bought by corporates and special interests and he was absolutely right and one thing that has come about from this uh palestinian i can't i don't even call it an israel palestinian war because how can you have a no, war when not. It, it's, it is it's just, just genocide, slaughter. it's slaughter. Yeah, yeah. Um, one thing that has come about from this is, uh, even though Facebook is uh, taking away uh, posts that's put, because let's be honest, Western media, because media is mostly Western, 
is only showing their side, which is the side of supporting Israel. What's come about is that people are protesting mm. so much around the world, and it's they're coming out in droves, in thousands and hundreds of thousands, in countries where the government is saying we're supporting Israel, but the people are clearly showing they're supporting oh, well, Palestine. Even in the USA, yeah, with its very limited uh, access to what's happening in the world, uh, their own uh, opinion polls show that 70% of the American people are opposed to the genocide in yeah. in, in Palestine, in Gaza. Yeah. Uh, so even in the USA, yeah. that's the case. Even in the UK, which again is a heavily controlled media yeah. uh, in the hands of a handful of billionaires, oligarchs, and of course the government and BBC. I mean, I, yeah. <laughs> the BBC. It's I a mean, joke. <laughs> it's yeah. a, I call it the best of British censorship, yeah. you know? Uh, I know from biased, social media. It's, biased Broadcasting Corporation. Uh, biased very Broadcasting biased. Corporation. Yeah. I, I sort of meant in the sense that what I, I found is certainly, uh, certainly saw that in Bangkok, certainly, certainly saw that in Chiang Mai, and I'm sure it's prevalent in Chiang Rai, that you can come here and it wouldn't be very difficult for you to find a group of Farang, this, this Facebook groups and whatnot, and, and you can mingle with people and make friends pretty quickly. I mean, I'm not saying the greatest of friends, that takes time. But sometimes just even knowing that you, you have somebody, yeah. you have something in common if you have with... Sh if you shared an interest, I mean, typically, you say, the bikers groups, yeah. and they're not necessarily... Some of them are, what do they call themselves? One percenters, or they, they, they wear badges. And you have to sort of, you know, like the Hells Angels or those other... Yeah. MC, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And those are a more serious sort of, yeah. you know... Yeah. Uh, members, non-members, you know, it's, it, that's a serious... That's another sort of category, which I'm not familiar with and not very interested in, but there are very informal bikers groups, two or three of them at least in Chiang Mai. There's even two or three of them, I think, in Chiang Rai. Yeah. And yeah, you're quite right. If you share an interest, even a very casual one in riding a motorbike, it yeah. doesn't have to be a big, expensive Harley Davidson cruiser or something yeah. like that. Uh, it can be a very simple bike, uh, and it often is, normally is for those people. You'll find an opportunity You'll find to it, be yeah, included and, in, a, yeah, in a group, like a this friend, friend of mine who referred to the God's waiting room. We met in a, on a bike ride yeah. in one of those informal bikers groups from Chiang Mai. Yeah. You're right, that's an easy way. And of course, if other people have other interests, if you're a chess player or whatever, or interested in football, and you go to that local pub where they have live uh, transmissions yeah. of games, you will sit there and talk about your team or whatever. I, I don't know. Yeah, of course, that's, I think that's, um, yeah, that's easy. And I suppose the climate actually, of course, that makes it much easier. I mean, imagine that right now we're in the middle of, of December. Back in Europe, most of Europe, Northern Europe, single literally digits, getting out of the door. It's single down digits the or without, minus. Yeah, yeah. and yeah, when you've got to worry about icy pavements and things or how to get to the shops and how to get, you know, even yeah. physically get out and meet people. That, of course, is not an issue in the way that it is in yeah. some very cold parts of the world right now. So that makes things easier here, you know, physically. The, the climate makes it easier. It's easier to get out and about here, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that's, yeah, the whole sort of fellowship thing. I suppose, I don't know. I'm actually I'm quite an independent person. That's why I think I have, there's less of an issue than for m many people, you know? I don't, I don't need to be, Yes. Uh, I don't need to be, and I'm not knocking them. It's people no, I live in different ways, but I don't need to be, Propping up a bar, you know, a, a bar counter five nights a week, like some people do in Thailand. Yeah, and they need that sense of fraternity with yeah. other foreigners, yes, yeah. often people from their own country. Yeah, and probably supporters of the same football team or whatever. I don't need that. Yeah. I don't want it. Um, but and, it's something that if somebody did need, it is something it's that there they can find. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think so yes, it's, a, it's 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 certainly here. And of course, the the so-called expat foreign community is big enough. In, in my opinion, it's too big in some areas, which is why I don't want to live there. But, yeah. you know, Pattaya, I think, is is very much under foreign uh, control, if not, yeah. you know, the people who pay, uh, patronize those places are in, in, in mostly foreign. I, I was, so I was, you've got a big foreign community. It's almost like being back wherever your people come from. Yeah, I was in, in uh, I've only been to Pattaya once, and, and that was only because I was uh, moving on to um, Rayong, uh, and Sattahip. Yeah. Um, and I remember stopping at a place, a little hotel, and I met some chaps from Leeds. Yeah. And they were retired. And so I was asking them, what do you do? And they said, basically, uh, we can't afford the beer from 7-Eleven now. I mean, they were on a state pension. So 
they said they brew their own beer and they stay there. They rent a room on a very uh, economical rate. And basically there's a group of them and they just relax and, you know, talk to each other and, and, and let, as you said, let time pass by until that well, final yes. curtain call. What they would do back home probably. I yeah, mean, not but, a, but it, no. what I was trying to uh, suggest is that they were still comfortable because they had a fraternity of people. Yeah. Whereas I think what they were implying that is in England, you're in your own home, you're in your own whatever apartment yeah. or house. Or... I suppose there are for a lot of people, pubs and clubs. Yeah. But when you, or you get very old, like, uh, you know, you get very old, like my father lived to 92, my mother lived to 100, made it to 100 last year. Wow. Um, and both of them, luckily, did not have issues, big issues with dementia and so on. Uh, because, you know, a serious discussion for me, a serious issue would be how I'd want to be or where I'd want to be or if I'd want to be anywhere after losing my mind, which a yeah. lot of people in the West, it's a Western problem, yeah. I think. I think people die naturally before mass, you know, dementia is a mass, yeah. mass as an issue, a, a social issue, is I think a, an issue in the Western world, in the advanced and the yeah. rich world. I don't think... It's such an issue in a country like Thailand, where people live into their 80s and 90s yes. in the way they do and in the And also in, 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 the, in the Asian uh, uh, continent, uh, people live with family. That's the huge so difference, when, of course. Even if yeah. there is a situation of yeah. dementia, the children are still there, grandchildren yes. are close by. In fact, and it's so completely you, foreign, I, the idea yeah. of home. Yeah. My mother was in a very good home, probably one of the best homes in the country, in fact. Yeah. And, <laughs> and also quite an expensive home, but that's okay. Um, for the last years of her life. Uh, so she had a, a good home that she lived in. She was very well looked after. But even so, I would not personally want to live in that environment myself. Yeah. I would much rather be in a small place in Thailand than be in the home that she yeah, was in, yeah. even though it was a wonderful home. Um, and you're right, in, in most, if not all of Asia, the whole idea of institutions for old people in the yeah. way that they exist where we come from, yeah. is complete anathema. I mean, they, they don't it's know actually, they it's, don't a, it's it. a point of shame. Well, yes. Yeah, so, uh, On the other hand, it must obviously create other social problems. You know. I, I uh, guess if everyone does the same thing, it's not deemed um, extraordinary or out of place. So because with Asian people, elderly grandparents always live with their children or their yeah. grandchildren, if you were to put them into a home, that would be deemed out of the ordinary. So when something's ordinary, it's never like a, it's never a social issue. But it's, it's, it's the concept of the family. I think it's about, uh, you know, I, I'm not saying I pine for that. I'm not saying I would have volunteered and I didn't to, to, uh, to invite my mother in her 80s, yeah. 90s, 90s, yeah. not 80s, yeah. 90s. The last 10 years of her life, she was in her 90s. Uh, and when she went into the home, she was already in her 90s. And I didn't volunteer for her to move to Prague as I might have done, but then to have to organize medical yeah. care, probably around the clock nursing yeah. care for her. Yeah. Which is what I would have had but to But would done. you would you not argue, because obviously you've seen now the Asian side and you've seen the Western yes. side, uh, the family nucleus in Europe is very different to the family nucleus. Yes. So <coughs> putting a parent in a home in Europe isn't deemed shameful. It's actually no, no. normal. It's, no, it's, it's normal. And it's normal. In, in the way in which society is organized, yeah, it's probably work is organized. It's probably Your more Both caring. parents have to go out to work, as yeah. they often do in most countries. Yeah. Otherwise, they cannot afford to pay the rent yeah. or pay the mortgage. Yeah. And at the same time, look after elderly parents who yeah. may or may not be, you know, have dementia issues or other health issues. Yeah. Uh, and they may not have the space. Yes, I mean, we right. know how people in the UK in particular live in the tiniest of properties. Yeah. yeah. Tiniest of properties, yeah. nothing like as palatial as my house here in nothing Thailand. At all, yeah. Um, for a single they don't man, even have yes. the space. <laughs> yeah, they don't even have the space uh -huh. for for an elderly parent. Yeah. Live, let alone the means to look yeah. after them and so on. Yeah. So yeah, there are reasons why those institutions exist in the West, and they don't exist here. Absolutely. And like I said, I think I haven't looked at the you know the demographic statistics, but I, I imagine I'm pretty certain uh, that if you look at the, the demography of a country like Thailand, as opposed to Japan, which has yes. the oldest population in the world, right. but it's a much richer country than Thailand, 
Um, but I think even in Japan, I understand there aren't the same institutions or not the same way as you find in Western, in the West, in the Western yeah, world. Yeah. But having said that, I think Thailand has far fewer. You know, does the share of population over the age of, say, 70 or 80 or 90 as a share of the total population is probably far lower than yes, in the is. West because yeah. of, for economic reasons. Econo and, and the fact that I think people work till very late in yeah, their life in Thailand. It's, there's no uh, state age. That no, no, and there's no state you, aid. Yeah. There's no public, there's no, there's no welfare state. Yes, yeah. In and with, with, with Vietnam, sorry, with Japan, they, they have a different issue. They have the issue that they're not having enough younger generation being uh, born mm. to, to look after, to service, yeah, yeah. and to uh, the country work and the their economy. After, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's a. Right, yeah. okay, Patrick, we, 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 we Yeah, it? I think we kind of. <laughs> Have we got enough there? How long do we talk for? I don't hour know, but, uh, I think we've got enough to make 30 minutes out yeah, of it, haven't we? Yeah, and. Uh, with yeah. ruthless editing there, I think we've yeah. got. No, I think we've got a good 30 minute chat yeah. there, you know.